how awful it is for me to forget this, but my, my dad called me this morning and wanted to uh, have everyone remember my mother Tuesday. She has another scan for her cancer, and they're always prayerful that it's in the shrinking process and the, the um, medication that she takes uh, drains her quite a bit, and that's why she's not here most Sundays uh, because of uh, what she deals with. So just be prayerful that they get uh, good results on Tuesday or the scan will be Tuesday, but uh, the results will come after that. You know, uh, you know how the waiting is when you go through this uh, to see how things are progressing. Um, I, I do want to remind us that we have the Truth Project tonight. It's so good to have Jonathan Stormer back. You know, he's, we've missed him while he's gone, and uh, it's good to have him back. So he'll be leading that tonight uh, at 6 o'clock, so please uh, plan to be here for that. And, and I also want to just remind everyone that Miss Stephanie Rouse will be leaving next Saturday for Guatemala. She'll be gone for is it a week, Stephanie? There you go, a week. And, uh, you know, uh, she was talking about she needed to pack, and I told her, you don't need to pack. You just need to go. Just throw your pair of shorts and a T-shirt in the bag and, you know, and go on. That's all you'll need there. But uh, Just be prayerful for her and uh, that, that God will use her and that she will make a, uh, a difference in lives uh, that she encounters, uh, and for it to teach her, as it should teach all of us, that every life that we encounter, we should make a difference. Uh, whether we have to go to Guatemala or whether we go to the R Mart, whatever it may be, that we uh, make a difference. Um, I, ha I was asked this morning to do something, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea. It, it, hasn't, it wasn't planned, and I know some of you may not be here uh, to participate in this, but... Um, we have some college students that are getting ready to go off to school, and uh, when? When is it? When do they go? When? Okay. Okay, when are you, when are you going, Michaela? 11th. When are you going, Jerry? Okay. What I want to do is I want to have all the college, all those that are going off to college to come up for just a moment. And we want to have a prayer with them. Um, if, if you're going to college, uh, I, I, I don't care. Uh, if, I, if, it, if I didn't mention you right here, uh, come on, come on, come on. It wasn't a it wasn't a suggestion. Um, I, I'm gonna get out of your comfort zone. Come here with me. Come here with me just a minute. This this message today is is about praying for people that we love. Okay, this is this is what it's about. So we we want to do that. And I, and I and I say and I say this. You know, uh, and, we, and we talk about this a lot when when we get ready to send. We get ready to send students off somewhere to college. Uh, number one, they're representing our Lord Jesus Christ where they go. And the other thing is they, they need to represent the church from which they came, from this community from which they came, okay? And, and so when people see them, when people begin to talk with them and see that they are different than the other folks that are around them, we want them to ask the question, where are you from? You, where, where did you go to church? We, we want them to ask those things about these, these young people, okay? And, uh, and so we want to encourage them and pray for them uh, collectively uh, that uh, they will stand firm in the gap and uh, that God will use them in the place that they are and make a difference in the life that they encounter. Amen? Let, let's pray for these. Uh, Lord, I just thank you so much that, that we have... Uh, these young men and women uh, that we're sending off. I mean, we're, we're sending them out to, uh, to encounter a world that's going to be very foreign and it's going to be very uh, difficult to deal with in many cases. Uh, they, they go for a purpose. They go for a purpose to be educated and to learn. But the greater purpose that each of us have in the world that we are is to share you with another life. And so I pray, Lord, that just through their, through their, their attitudes and their their responses to the things that they, they see and, and, and the things that people say, that they will be seen as a light in the schools that they will attend, that the people around them in their, in their, in their classrooms or in their, in their dorms, wherever that they may be, that they will see that there's a true difference in these people. Now, I'm going to ask you this, God. I'm going to ask for a, a gracious protection to come over these, these, these two, two ladies and, and a young man that's here and, and others that... That, that, that are a part of our community, too, that we send out, Lord. I just pray, God, you just protect them. You watch over them. You guide them. You, 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 you send the angels, dispatch what's necessary to, to, to guard them and the situations that they'll be in. But, God, I just pray that, that through the power that you give, that the power will be exhibited 
wherever that they stand, wherever they're, wherever, whatever they encounter, whoever they may uh, be with. So God, just protect them, watch over them. Let them also know that they're loved and prayed for daily and that we care so very much for them. I thank you, God, in advance for what it is that you are going to accomplish through their lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. <laughs>
That's what prayer is about. Turning to the one who is in control. And that's not you. Turning to the one that's in control. I think sometimes even our prayers, you know, that we do have uh, are not a, much of a threat to God and because they're, they're so ritualistic and they're so, uh, they're so memorized. And even in those that the devil is saying, that's not a concern. That's not a concern. And I tell you, when we teach our kids to pray. There's no doubt. We teach them, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord. My, we, we teach them. We teach them to, to, to ask God to bless the food, you know. Uh, you know, God is great, God is good, let, him, let us thank Him for our food. We teach our children those things. Not that that should be their only prayer, but we teach them the fact that you should pray, that we should be grateful that the food that we have here, it's not by your hand that you have received it, it is because of God's grace that He has given it to you. That when we lay down at night, we recognize that, Lord, you're in control of the day and the night. If I wake up, praise God. If I don't, praise God. It's the, it's the attitude that we're teaching our children that prayer is a necessity of life. Now, if we look in this verse 14, we're going to see a passage that's uh, greatly debated. And, and I guess that's why I'm, I'm holding on to this one today as we, as we go through it. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of controversy concerning this process of anointing of oil, you know, and, and what does it really mean? And and, and I think today, even as I, as, as I, as I speak before you, I, I'm not going to preach. I, I, well, I don't know. I, it's going to be a lesson. It's going to be a Bible lesson, I think, that we need to learn some things from this passage of Scripture. We need to have some understanding of what it is that James is teaching, okay? Verse 14, is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him. And anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, the, the Catholic Church. I don't know if some of I'm, I'm sure there's some of you here that uh, that have a Roman Catholic background, and and you and and you may recognize this, but this is this is the scripture that they use where the priest will come to the person that's in uh, in, in danger of imminent death. You've seen it on TV in places where the priest will come and give the last rites. Okay, and 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 this is the scripture where they draw this from. The 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 term that's used is extreme unction. And, and this is when the priest will come and prepare this person for the next world. Now, now, if you read this, if you read this, it's obvious that the preparation that's taking place is the preparation to be well. So uh, you, you, you are uh, sensible people. You, you think about this yourself also. Um, I, I think as we look into this this morning that... Uh, and we realize that this is a very greatly debated passage. And you may sit here and say, well, I've never, never heard any debates about it. I've never, I've never heard any controversy about this particular passage. But there is. There is. And, and the reason I say that is because, listen to me, I, I, I don't know how much, how much preparation. You teachers, I, I'll speak to you in this, but I, how, how you prepare. Uh, myself, I, I read lots of books during the week to make preparation for the message that I want to share on Sunday. A lot of different People that I trust, people that I trust that teach, read commentaries and, and, and books and, and literature concerning this particular subject. And so on this one, on this one, you're going to find a, a wide variety of uh, attitudes about what it means. And, and I'm gonna, we're going to discuss those today. But here's, here's why I have the problem. And, th and this, is, this is something that it concerns me and it should concern you. Because when somebody gets up to teach or preach and they come and they tell you this, the Lord spoke to me, and he cleared this up, that this is what this means. Now, to me, that sounds really good because I can trust the guy that just said it. And then I, and then I listen to another guy that I trust a lot, and he, told, he says the same thing. The Lord cleared this up in my mind and, and directed me to teach it this way. It is different from what he just said. The other guy said, well, who's right? And they both can't be right, can they? So, so that's why I say we're going to look at this. We're going to examine this passage of Scripture. Because, you know, the doctrine of theology, Steve Grissom is standing before you today, and he's going to give you some instruction that you really should take heed to, right? Now, I'm telling you, listen to me. What we're going to do today is we're going to trust the Holy Spirit guides each of us because I claim ignorance uh, for the most part. And, and we're going to let God help deal with us as we examine this a little bit further. Okay? All right. Thank you, Adam. And thanks for the amen on the doctrine part, too.
You know, you know and, and, the, and the problem I think sometimes, a lot of folks come to church and, and they just say, well, I come to hear what the pastor had to say because he knows everything, right? Now, you guys probably don't say that, but, 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 but there's people that do. You know, they come to church and they say, My, and, and I hear this all the time, and this is why I say it, because I'll talk with someone about a particular subject, and they'll say, well, my pastor teaches it this way, or my pastor says this is what it is, or my pastor, t- let me tell you, just tell you something. How about read this book yourself, okay? Read it for yourself and try to figure out these things. Now, you need to realize that before I come here on Sunday mornings, that I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that I'm accurate. Am I perfect? Well, they get no amen then, did I? No, man, I'm telling you, you know, it's important that you be like the Bereans and you study the word yourself and you let it make sense to you. As, as Paul told the church in Corinth, you're sensible people. Think about it. Work through it. See what it says. Is anybody sick? Hmm. Um. And, and, and as I look at this subject this morning, even though there's controversy in it, I want you to know something. It, this isn't going to affect a person's salvation, okay? But at the same time, it shouldn't be just something that we pass over. I mean, because why? It's God's Word. And, and, there, and there's no part of God's Word that we just say, well, that was not so important. I don't understand it completely. I'll just skip to the next passage. That's not what we should be doing. We should dig into it. We should try to understand what it is that God's teaching us in each and every word that he has in this book. So that's what we want to do. Don't, don't make light of it. Don't, don't, don't read through something like this sometimes and just say, well, I, I, don't, I don't understand that, so I'm going to keep right on going. No, when you don't understand that, that's where you stop. That's where you stop, and, you, you, and you, then you begin to try to discover. You begin to investigate. You, try to, you ask questions. You get a group together if you have to. You do, do something to try to find some understanding about what it is that he's saying in this particular thing. This subject this morning, you know, is, is, is can be very difficult, you know. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful when we talk about this, this anointing of oil, you know, for the sick. And, and, and the thing you have to also understand when we, when we go into a particular passage like this, there's no other places in the Bible that gives a definition of what it is. Now, there's places where it mentions the anointing of oil, but it doesn't give an explanation as to what the anointing means. So we have to try to work through some of these ourselves. You know, there's a couple places in the Bible the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, where, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the, uh, the Samaritan found the, uh, the man that was beside the road and, and that he was, uh, he was beaten up and left for dead. And, and we know that he took, he took wine, wine and oil and poured over the wounds, okay? So, so we see some reasons there. We, all, we also know that in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 13, after Jesus had sent out the twelve, and when they came back, when they went out into the, in, into the community and began to uh, share the gospel, and when they came back, it says in verse 13, it says, They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. But that's all it says. So, we're going to try to discover what it is. So let's, let's examine this, and, and let's trust in the Holy Spirit to help guide us. And, 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 I, and I just ask you also to just... Let loose of any of the preconceived ideas that you may have. And just let's, let's let God deal with us in this, okay? Verse 14, and I'll, and I'll read this several times probably through here because this is, this is the passage I'm going to preach on today. Is any one of you sick? You should call the elders of the church and pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. So, so what is it that's being taught in this passage? I said earlier that the Catholic Church has used this passage to give authority to anoint people that are... Uh, are close to the place of, of passing on. There's, there's many people today that, that believe that the anointing of the oil and, and the miraculous healings that have taken place ended uh, after the age of the apostles. And that, that age of miracles ended uh, when it was no longer said to be needed uh, from that point on. And I don't, I don't know if you're a student of John Calvin. Uh, John Calvin was uh, one of the great reformists. He's a... Uh, He's one probably the Baptist church uses as the uh, doctrine of their uh, studies and, and uh, theology. Um, there's, there's Calvinists and there's Armeni, um, Armenianism. Uh, or, I can't even pronounce it now. But, but, but Calvin also was one that taught that the uh, age of the miraculous signs ended after the apostles. And I, and I could get into a lot of stuff in there. And we talk about... Um, 
people that are in the mission fields and, and have, have seen things that many of the people that especially in the United States uh, take for granted, you know, uh, as, as concerning uh, a person's health, health or, or sickness. But uh, that, that's for another time, and we can talk about it uh, more later. But um, a, a person that does not believe that miraculous events still take place, you know, can find very strong and valid reasons why they don't. Okay? People that believe that miraculous events still take place can find strong and valid reasons why they do. Amen? I mean, I, I, can, I can look at this group here, and I suspect if I were to ask for a vote, we would probably, uh, a, a good portion would side for one way and a, and a good portion side on the other. You know, I, and, and the reason I have issue with that in this particular instance you know, as, as we read this one here in James, you know, he's, he's not calling for the apostles. And even though people say it's the apostles' age, he's not calling for... This, this, is, a, this is an instruction to the church. Okay. Now, even more so, this is an instruction not to the, to the United, United Church of, of all the Christians, but to specific church, as he could speak to you and I today as Albertson Missionary Baptist Church. He's not calling for the apostles to come and anoint and pray for healing. He's calling for the elders. He's calling for the elders to come and to pray. And who are the elders? Well, you know, and, and that can be confusing also most especially in the Baptist church. And, but, but the elders for the most part as they were in the day of the early church were the pastors in the church. They were the ones, the teachers and the preachers in the church. We, we have elders, we have deacons. And, and so in, in, in the early church you saw more of a plurality of the pastors that were in the church. Most likely there was a, there was a lead pastor but there was, there was teachers that were in the church. And so these were called in to do this particular task. And, and, and in the Baptist church, you know, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not going to get into the doctrine of the Baptists uh, for, for this reason this morning. But our deacons, for the most part, as we look at the leaders in the church, they're servant leaders, and they, and they wear many hats, whether or not they, they're deacons or elders. They, they work and participate in so many different aspects of what this verse is talking about. Uh, another teaching here also is that this anointing of oil is, is no longer necessary because it was a form of medicine at that time. And that the rubbing of oil, uh, you know, had healing properties in the today because of there's so many advances in medicine and, and all the availability to hospitals and clinics. That this is not something that's important any longer. It's, it's almost as saying that the, uh, the elders of the church went out for the purpose of, of, of using the oil to bring about healing in, in people's lives. You know, I, I normally keep a bottle of oil. I have, I have some anointing oil that's in the other uh, pulpit. I meant to bring it over here this morning. And, but um, used for the purpose of, of anointing for people that would ask for it. And I, and I, believe, that, uh, I believe that if a person is sick, they should seek medical help. Okay? And not just come to the pastor and ask him to anoint them with oil without seeking medical help. Um, let, let me just ask you this question. Who heals? And how does he heal? The, the, the answer really is how he pleases, right? So, so God is the healer. God is the person who heals, whether or not it's a miraculous healing through laying on of hands and anointing with oil, or whether or not it's through a surgery, or whether it's through a treatment that a doctor provides. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Another area of teaching is, is that, and I, t I tell you, this is a, it's a, hopefully a teaching lesson, and you may be more confused uh, when you leave than you, than you got here. But another area of teaching is that it, it's, all, it's always God's will for us to be well. Okay? Now listen to me carefully. Another area of teaching is always God's will for us to be physically well. And, you know, that, that we should never have a sickness, and, and, and truthfully, if that were so, that we should have those sick people in the church. I mean, we're going to look at, we're going to look at uh, verse 15 uh, in some more detail, but, but when, we, when we see this, when we read this, we, we see it as there should be no sickness in the church if, if we follow these instructions right here to pray and anoint. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I ask you to be careful when you hear this type of teaching because it's not biblical. Uh, if, if you know the story in 2 Corinthians where Paul uh, had had a thorn in his flesh. 
And he asked the Lord to remove it three times. And what did the Lord tell him at that? He said, no, Paul, I'm not going to do it. I want you to have this. Now, you can go into a lot of guesswork about what the thorn was. People can say that it was people that was worrisome to him or, or it could be whatever, uh, but it could be actually a physical ailment that he had. We know if we read the scriptures that he had, had a, a big problem with his vision. He was going blind. So he asked for that to be removed, and God told him, no, you're going to keep it. You're going to keep it. And there was a purpose involved in it. There was a purpose that was involved in it because he, was, he wanted to make sure that Paul remained humble for the, for the things that he had seen and witnessed. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you to deal with this, Paul. So sometimes God's answer, as, as we ask for healing in our lives, is no. I want you to endure this. I want you to handle this. And you've got the strength through me to deal with it. Now, we don't like that because we want God to take everything, every ailment, every problem that we have away. We think that when God loves us, He doesn't want us to hurt. He doesn't want us to feel depressed. He doesn't want us to deal with these sufferings that we have. And the truth of it is, He doesn't want you to suffer through it, but He wants you to acknowledge that He is in control of it, that He's given us grace enough to handle it. Every one of us is in here. So just be careful in, in that teaching also. I think when we deliberately begin to study this Bible, we begin to see that there are things that we just read over. But I, I just pray, Albertson, if, if we're going to be students of God's Word, and, and I believe that we must, um, that we really need to examine each of these passages. And, and, and you know, when you read some of this, you say, well, some of these teaching seeds are, conf are, are confusing. God's Word should be just so clear that a kindergartner should be able to read it and, and say. You know, Peter... Peter wrote about Paul's writings because, I don't know, if, if, if you may read the book of Romans and some of the other writings of, of Paul and just say, man, piece of cake, I understand all of it. Well, I want you to be my teacher because I had to spend a lot of time and energy trying to know what it is. And those that you come out on Wednesday nights, you know how I struggle with it. But Paul, Paul's writing sometimes was confusing. I'm not talking about Paul's right now, but, but just to give an example of this, Peter himself in 2 Peter 3.16 acknowledges this. He says, he writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Peter, the apostle, writes this himself. That he, he's talking about Paul's writings. He says, he says his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do of, or they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. He's speaking of Paul's letters, and don't, don't, leave, don't leave and say, well, Steve said that, that Peter said this about James's letters. I, no, but I believe that it could be put in the same category. And some of these things we, we have difficulty in trying to understand. And, and, and people do take scriptures like this, and, and they distort them so that they can express their own agendas through them. Okay? So, so you see this lots of times. Look, I'm, I'm going to tell you about, and I'm, well, I'll just tell you. This is somebody I respect a lot and I use to help me study. John MacArthur, I'm a, a wonderful commentator. And, and, I, and I have lots and lots of his books that I use uh, in helping me prepare lessons and, and, and messages on Sunday. And, and he is one of those that uh, is so adamant in believing that this era of miraculous things are over. Now, now it's true that we don't see these things as often as it was experienced during the time that Christ were here and the time the apostles were here for a reason. Most of these signs were done for a particular reason to bring attention to who Jesus was. And when, when these apostles and, and they went into these foreign lang, lands where there were nothing but pagans and they didn't know nothing about Jesus Christ, they didn't know nothing about Yahweh, they knew nothing about nothing other than the gods that they worshipped, their little, their little idols, there was things that were done to bring attention to who he was or who he is. But now America and the civilized world that we think of is, uh, is filled with God's Word. Whether or not it's listened to or read, it's there and available for everyone. So there's not the need for the attention to be brought for the purpose to point to Christ. Now there's other things, there's other reasons that Jesus heals. There's other reasons that, that people are miraculously healed. 
but that may not necessarily be the one now. Now, you, if you're like me and you read some stuff about missionaries that go into India or in some places where there's, there's never anything heard of God, there are things that they talk about, those missionaries there, watching the dead being raised, they watch people being healed from the sick, uh, uh, leprosy, and, the, and all these things that, that have been taking place in, in, the, in the first century, taking place even today. And I, and, I, and I have to believe them. Just because I haven't seen it and I haven't experienced it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not real. Okay? All right. I had, uh, when I was a young boy, I, I remember I, I had these al allergies. And uh, I would, my hands would swell up, my face would swell up, my feet would swell up. And, and my parents would send me to doctors and doctors, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And, um, I was, uh, I didn't even realize this was happening, but one night, these men came to the house, and they, they, uh, they prayed over me, and they anointed me with oil. So my, my mom and dad had, had called the elders in the church to come and pray with me and anoint me with oil. I was so impressed with that, so impressed with it. And, and, uh, and, I, and I had the faith. I knew God was going to deliver me of this. I just, I just trusted in it. But I struggled with it for the, right on through my teen years and, and until I was an adult. Same thing. And after I got married, uh, I still had some issues with it, and I went and got tested, and uh, come to find out I was allergic to cats and certain kind of foods and stuff like that. And when I avoided that, I stopped having those problems. He healed me. How? In whatever way he pleased. You know, I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful for what God does. However it may be. Now, let me just tell you this. I believe with all my heart that that night that they placed hands on me and, and anointed me with oil, that God could have taken it away. Was it his will for that to happen? Obviously, it wasn't. Obviously, it wasn't. For whatever reason, it wasn't. Would that have been my preference? Absolutely. Because it was quite embarrassing for me many times because my face would swell up and my lips would get really big and people would make fun of me. Girls wouldn't want to kiss me. That was my excuse why they didn't, even though it's probably some other reason. It's obvious that when James wrote these words, he knew exactly what he was talking about, right? And most likely, the people he was writing these words knew exactly what he was talking about. But 2,000 years later, as we examine it, we live in a different culture and the context of things are a little bit different. We struggle with it. We struggle with what it is exactly he's talking about. So, so let's, let's, like I said, let's, let's proceed with caution in this. Um, I, I, know, I know that some of you here uh, like things pretty cut and dry. And uh, when, when things kind of go in this way, it, it kind of drives you mad. You know, when it's just not real clear as to what it is that you should think or how you should understand something. Many, many people, as I said earlier, uh, look for that guidance from the pastor but I'm asking that you uh, seek the Holy Spirit as we, as we try to learn this. Um, and, and, and the reason I say that, I want, I want you to understand why I'm saying that. I'm, I'm, not making, I'm not saying it for just to be saying it. It's because people become followers of men. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? And, and that, that's not where you need to be. You don't need to be followers of men. You need to be followers of God. Okay. Well, I, I've spent a lot of time, you know, talking about... Um, or what's being taught as far as the scripture and, and what other people may see it. So let, let's, let's just kind of examine it ourselves. So the, so the first thing of all, let's look at who the people are that are involved, the people that were involved. He, he says, if, if, if any of you are sick, you should call the elders of the church and pray over them, anoint with them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, so we see that the church is involved. I'll go from the back to the front a little bit, but we see that the church is the one that's involved. You should, you should call the elders in the church. Now, now, I want you to understand something about the church. He's talking about a localized community church is what he's dealing with here. He's not talking about the general church. He's talking about the church that you're a part of, the one that you're associated with, okay? So even then, even then, James understood the importance of why we should have a community church, why we should congregate together, why we should come together as a group of people. Because we are part of a community of faith. This, this teaching is consistent all through the Bible. God, God redeems us individually, but we're not, we're not to be individual in our redemption. We, we're, we have a purpose 
that others should be involved in, okay? We're to form a, a, a relationship with other people. You know, other people that have been saved, other people that are, are like-minded. We, we are a part of the church. And, and friends, if, if you're not a part of the church community, I urge you to do so. Stop, stop right now. If you're here and you're not a member of a church, there's no reason why you shouldn't join ours. If you're a believer, there's no reason why you should not be a part of our fellowship. A member. Someone that, someone that has something to share. Not just something to receive, but something to share. That's why we come together. So that we can learn from one another. So we can celebrate in, 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 in the things that go well in your life. So that we can be there with you when things are going, when you're going through some times of difficulty. Be a part of it. Join it. Unite with it. Amen, Steve. Amen. G Gary Tillman taught this, I think, uh, uh, I don't know when it was from the pulpit here, uh, months and months ago, might have been a year or so ago now, I can't even remember, about the one another's, you know, the, all those that are in the Bible. There's, 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 I think there's 59 of them. There's, they're not in there for no reason. The one another's are in there so that we can help edify one another, to lift one another up, to share with one another. We do that apart with the community that we're in. Anyway, so if you don't join the church today, uh, I've given you a great opportunity to do that, and you consider that today, or please talk with me about it later. So who, 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 so who are those that are involved? You know, the church, you know, and, and who in the church he's talking about? He's talking about the elders, you know, and, and here, th these are the under shepherds that are responsible to the Lord, but are in service to the people. And, and we are here to provide understanding and, and possibly healing that comes from God. The spiritual leaders in the church, whether they be pastors, elders, deacons, that's where it should come from. And, and, and that's, why, that's why it's such a blessing when the church supports the leadership of the, of the people in the church that, that, are, that God has called to lead. In Hebrews chapter 13, 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. See, that's a big responsibility there, to be accountable for what it is that's being taught, for how you're being led and how you're being prayed for. Obey them so that their work will be jo a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. I'm going to tell you, friends, it is a great joy when the church, where the people in the church are submissive to the leadership in the church. But when every decision of the leaders is called into question and every direction in which they, they try to lead is argued against, then leading the church becomes a great burden. And the church suffers because of that. Not just the leaders. The entire church suffers because of that. So part of the responsibility of the elders of the church is to extend or, or be available to those that are sick in the church. And also another person that is involved in this is the man that's sick. The man that is sick. And, and, and the word for sick here is Ashtonai, Ashtonai is the Greek word, and it doesn't just simply mean, you know, uh, a, a, a physical sickness, but, but the, the word actually means without strength. Now, for the most part through the scriptures, it talks about a physical sickness, but it's not the only place. It's not exclusive to just talking about physical sicknesses. It, it, can, it can be talking about it, it, or weaknesses that we go through. It's, it can refer to all kinds of weakness, whether it's a mental weakness, whether it's a moral weakness, whether it's a spiritual weakness, or it could be just a physical weakness that we have. All of these things. And those that I mentioned earlier, and, and, and what they do is they cling to the thing where it talks about the, the mental, the moral, you know, or the spiritual, and, and, and disregard the physical altogether. I can't do that. It's got to be inclusive of all of those things. It's got to be inclusive of all of those things. Now, if we don't have to deal with the physical sickness part of it, it makes everything a lot easier. It makes things not so miraculous any longer. But because of this word sickness, you know, refers to other meanings, it, it, it should encourage those in the church that suffer from these weaknesses to call upon the leaders to come and to pray for you. Yeah, look, you might, you might be in a situation that you're just in a mess. 
you know, you may, you may be dealing with some moral issues that you just can't deal with. It's, it's, you're, you're struggling with something. You're struggling with something that you know you shouldn't be doing, something that you shouldn't be looking at, some places that you shouldn't be going. You can call the elders, you can call the leaders in the church to come and pray for you. You, you may be dealing with some depression in your life, something that you just struggle with and you just can't seem to break away from it. Call the leaders in the church to pray for you. You may be dealing with spiritual problems that you just, you just are, 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 are in, a, in a funk about, about what it is that God is and you don't understand some things and you just can't get past the place you are. Call the leaders, call the elders <coughs> to come and pray for you and to anoint you with oil. Don't be ashamed is what I'm trying to say. Don't be ashamed of the situation that you may be in. Unless you love living in it. You want to get out of it. You want to be healed. Call for help. And, and, and listen, you need to understand this. That, that as the elders, as the leaders in the church, we recognize that the body functions well when the whole body's well. Okay? When, when, but when there's one sick in the body, that causes problems for the whole body. So we're encouraged to come and help and to pray. We want that one part to be healed and, and to be rectified and, and to meet whole because it helps the whole body. It helps us to be able to function better. You understand what I'm saying? All right. And, and, and the thing that's important is the person, you know, it, it, it appears that the person that's sick is the one who's calling the elders, right? Now, it's not a responsibility of the elders just to go through the community and start looking for people that are sick. And so you look sick, I think I'll come and, and we'll come lay hands on you and heal you. No, 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 no. The thing that you've got to do is recognize that you've got a problem. Okay, you've got to recognize that. You've got to get to a place where you need someone to come and intervene. You need to call on God. And, and if I were to go and just point out some people, I think you're sick. I'd like to lay hands on you and, and anoint you with oil. And you said, well, there ain't nothing wrong with me, Steve. Well, I, I believe there is. But there ain't nothing going to happen. You have to recognize it. You have to recognize this. And this is how we approach God. Listen, you can't come to God. That's what well, you can't. I can't come to you and convince you in some kind of way through myself that you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't realize that you're lost, you're not ever going to be saved. You've got to recognize your need for Christ. Anyway. It also appears that it's, it's a private thing, not one necessarily in public. And, and like today, this morning, what, what a great uh, opportunity we had to come together to pray over our college uh, students that were going into college. And I believe in that, and I encourage that. that we come together as a, as a body to, to pray for one another, lay hands on other, one another, and lift them up to God. But this appears to be something private, that, that, that this sick person has called for them to come and, and, to, and to pray over them. You know, you can kind of picture it. They've got their hands over top of them, praying over them. Perhaps they're in the bed. So what do the elders do? They, they pray over the person. They anoint them with oil. And this, this whole thing with anointing of oil, <coughs> it becomes um, a stumbling block for many people. And, and before I, I, I go any, any more, I'll, I'll need to expel the notion that there's anything magical in the oil. And I've seen it on TV. I've seen it on some places where, you know, that you can order this particular oil that came from the Holy Land. And, and they won't say that, it, that it, it's, it's, well, no, I'll tell you what some of them do say. They, that, that, that these oils, the olives were picked from the Mount of Olives. Or, or it came from the Garden of Gethsemane and was squeezed in there. I believe even that a few drops of Jesus' sweat must have fell in that bottle. There's nothing magical about the oil. There's nothing magical about the oil. It's oil. It's oil, isn't it, Kathleen? Where are you at, dear? Okay. Tim used to always pick on her about that. But and for us country folks, it's oil. Oil. Isn't it, Tim? The word anoint here is alfeo, el, and, and, and it is, it's a literal term that means to, in, in rubbing oil onto somebody. It's, it, it was used when, when, you, when you had uh, people that come from a trip, and they took the saddle off their horse, and they would take oil, and they would rub it into its back, into its legs. Because they were grateful for the horse, you know, it was it was it, it it had some soothing qualities to it, you know, and and, and the problem we have to be with be, be careful about that, you know, because if we if we think that that's what it's for, we don't want you calling our elders or our deacons or most especially me out, 
to come give you a back massage. No, no, that's, that's, not, that's not what we're going to do here. But, but we see this, you know, in, in, in the story of the Good Samaritan where the oil was poured over this, this man that was in need to soothe the wounds. So some people believe that, you know, it, it, it helps and is used to anoint those that are sick and, and, it, and has healing qualities. We, we just should be careful there because, you know, we, we might have some issues with that. There, there, there are three interpretations here that, that, that people have to believe in. And, and number one is, as I told you earlier, the anointing of oil is a ritual event, and, and most, most especially with the Catholic churches, but it becomes a ritual event also for a lot of Protestant churches and the, that the anointing of oil has some medicinal quality or the oil is symbolic. Now, the oil itself is a symbol of something else. I want you to think about this now. And I believe that it is a representation or, of the healing presence of God. And, and now, you know, I, I know I've given you a lot of stuff to chew on this morning, and, and, and you have to come to an understanding and a belief that you need to embrace. And, and I can share with you that I believe that it means, or what I believe that it means anyway, and I'm confident in what I, what I say in this and what I believe that it is. And, and, and not to take... Uh, Anybody's experiences, lightly. I don't, I don't mean this at all. But I, if, if you tell me that you've been anointed with oil and you received a healing, I believe it. I believe it, okay? But I want you to know this. I believe that is the prayer. It is the prayer that brings the healing. It is the prayer that brings the healing in a person's life and not the oil, okay? And I, I believe that the oil is a symbol of God's healing. In verse 15, it says, And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. And we look at this verse here, and we run into another wall. And, and when we see here that, that when we pray in this manner that the sick person is going to be well, then I ask the question, why are there any sick people in the church? Why are there any sick people among us? If that's the truth, this is not. So we've got to look into that a little deeper. I mean, I, that gives you some questions, doesn't it? It does for me. Do you want to know the answer? Come back next Sunday. Back next Sunday, and we'll 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 look at that together. Don't ask me before next Sunday either. I'm still chewing on it. As I try to conclude in this, this passage of scripture establishes the importance and the workings of the local church. You hear what I'm saying? And 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 the and the benefits and responsibilities of the local church, and 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 what it has to offer the members also, and what the leaders' responsibilities are to the membership. Now, the most important lesson that should be brought to us today is the importance of prayer. The importance of prayer. Uh, the, the deacons and I were talking this morning. It was brought up that uh, we, need some, we need some lessons. We need some teachings on prayer, and we're going we're gonna to do that. I think it's so significant. Prayer is paramount in the, in the life and growth of the church. Prayer is the essential ingredient in, in, in our growing and trusting relationship that we should have with God. Prayer is so important, it's so vitally important to the local church and the community that we were part of. Prayer is the foundation from which we Christians must stand in order to have a growing relationship with our Lord God. And, 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 and we need to learn to pray right. We need to learn to pray right. And, and Jesus gives us that example in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark 14, 36. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Do you believe that? Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Take it away. Yet not what I will, but what you will. That should be our prayer. It should always be a prayer. And I, I, know, I know I've probably spent too much time on these two verses, and I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why. I, you know, normally when I get to the end of a book like this, I want to condense everything and move on to the next. I want to, I want to preach on Jonah. I've had this on my heart for quite a while. I want to teach on Jonah. So go ahead and start reading that, but I don't know when we'll get there. God's dealt with me on these, these couple of verses here, and I don't know, is any one of you trouble? You should pray. Anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? You should call the elders of the church and pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Amen. I, I, I don't know what you might be suffering from today, guys. But I do know that there's a healing waiting for you. You know what I'm saying? You're going through something right now. I don't know if it's physical, emotional, spiritual, moral. I don't know what it is, but there's a healing waiting for you if you want it. <laughs> but you've got to ask for it. 
You got to ask for it. You got to believe it. You got to ask for it. I, I mean, are you ready? Are you ready to ask someone for help? Are you ready for someone to intervene on your part? Because you may be struggling so much that you don't know how to pray anymore. You don't, you don't even have the ability to talk to God in that way. And, and you need to go to somebody and say, you got to help me. I can't even talk to God anymore. There's so much mess going on in my head and my heart. I need somebody to stand in my place. You've got to want to be healed. I, I love the story when Jesus healed the crippled man that was at the pool of Bethesda in John 5, 6. He said, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? What a crazy question. Do you want to get well? Well, you think, well, you're sure he does. He's been, he's been this way for 38 years. Let me tell you something, friends. I know a lot of people that are bad off that don't want to get well. They're happy right where they are. They're happy wallowing in the place that they are. Because the attention that comes to them through the situation that they're in, they don't want it left alone. You've got to ask for it. Let me just tell you what this man at, at, at the pool of Bethesda would have done. If Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? And the man had told him, Lord, no, not really. Jesus would have said, fine, and walked away. And he'll do the same thing today. He's asking the same question today. Do you want to be well? And if you sit here this morning and you say, no, I'll handle this on my own. I'll take care of it. He's just going to walk away. Fine. Do the best you can. Do the best you can. I'm telling you, friend, help is here. If we're willing to ask for it. Jesus told the man to take up his mat and walk. Now, let me just tell you this. When healing comes, you've got to accept the healing. You hear what I'm saying? You've got to accept that God has done what he said he would do. When, when God says, I'll deliver you from this, you've got to believe that he's done it. If God's going to take something away from you, you've got to believe that he's done it. You've got to believe it. And how he did that with the man with the mat, he said, get up, carry it away, let everybody see that you're no longer hindered from the infirmity. You got to claim it. I don't, I'm not saying this claim it, name it, claim it thing. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying when the Lord says something, when he deals with you, you got to act on what it is that he's done. And there's going to be people that are coming around you that are going to criticize you for what it is that you know that God has done in your life. Let them. Laugh all the way to the bank. And I'm going to tell you, friends, you and I have been given a mandate to ask for help. The leaders are to be obedient in God's word to pray for you and anoint you with oil. And I believe that it's the Lord's will. I believe that it's the Lord's will for people to be healed today. I believe it. I don't know what that healing may look like or what it may be, but I believe that that's what he wants to do. I don't know when he's going to do it. I don't know if he'll do it miraculously right now or if it takes 20 years. I don't know. But I know where the healing comes from. Put your faith in that. Put your faith in that. Let's pray. Lord, I, I, um, I ask that you I ask God that you will help us to turn to you. What you can do is everything. What we have to get over is ourselves. I pray, God, that we'll get over ourselves and we'll seek you, trust in you, and trust that this body that you placed us in is concerned and loves this person also enough to intervene prayer and thanksgiving and praise no matter what our case may be God let us turn to you let us seek you for the healing that you can bring in our lives I pray this in the name of Jesus Amen